We're supposed to be talking about the future of the border region, but I thought maybe we would start by talking about the present of the border region. Not what will we do in the future, but how are we doing now at educating students in this community and other communities along the border? So well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. What a pleasure, and we're always thrilled to have uh, Evan and the Tribune come in. Thank you. I'd be remiss, um, I have four board members here. If I didn't recognize my board, they're sitting separately, so we don't have a quorum. So I have two right here in the front, two on the right side. There's no Open Meetings Act violation That's or right. something, right? That's, That's right. Fine. We always have to make sure that we're, we're ensuring that we're following okay, the good. law. Um, we're doing better than we've ever done on the border with regards to higher education, and yet it's not enough. So if you look at, and I know you did because I watched your, your interview with Commissioner Keller, um, and so you're always ready for Evan Smith's questions. And so we're doing better, but we're not doing as well as we need to be doing. Um, I heard you reference the eighth grade cohort. So the eighth grade cohort is a trend line that looks at eighth graders and then goes out 11 years later and checks to see where they are 11 years later. Uh, this started back in 1997. The Houston Endowment is who created this. It was, it's referred to as the number. So in 1997, the state of Texas, 18 of those eighth graders, after 11 years later, were earning a credential in Region 19, which we call home, which is part of El Paso, 11 were earning that credential. So you come back to the most recent cohort, and the state is up to now 23%, so it's done about 5% better, and our region's now up to 20. So we're doing better. We've outperformed every other region of the state. We started the furthest behind, but we're not doing good enough. Yeah. But I want to one thing say for our state as a whole, I'm a very proud Texan, fourth generation on one side, on one side at least third generation on the other. I believe in Texas exceptionalism, except when the data doesn't support it. And what we have is we're seeing, um, because of the economy, and I don't begrudge the economy at all, in fact, I'm very proud, but we have to have more and more students go to college. And I hear this, you know, not everyone needs to go to college. And my question always is, are your kids going? Right. So whose kids don't have to go? You're anticipating a line of questioning I want to, I want to I uh, get, get, get to later because that is, in fact, one of the things you now hear is, well, maybe the answer to we're not doing well enough, President Wilson, is not everybody has to go. Right? Not everybody has to go to college. Not everybody has to go to college, but every, almost every student needs yep. some meaningful post high school credential. For, and, and the jobs of the 21st century are going to demand it. If you look at the jobs that have been created since 2008 and the last downturn, 90% of them require some post-high school credential. It might be a four-year degree. It might be an associate's degree. It might be a career and technical certificate, something. Something. Right. Yep. Yeah, and so you've been in the job not for terribly long, but you've been in academia before. You understand the conditions on the ground here. Is your assessment that the state, this community, this university is doing an adequate job of moving people from point to point? We're doing well, but not as well as we need to. And there's a, there's a chart I want to ask my team to just pass around, because it's something I asked our faculty and staff. Yeah. And that was, all right, look at the workforce and some college or above. If you look at some college or above, so associate's degree, bachelor's, anything above that, or even just you know went to some certain Took some credits, right. Some college or above. The most educated city in Texas is Austin. That doesn't surprise most people. But I'm going to ask you, Evan, of the top 20 cities in Texas, where do you think El Paso is? Are we using a six-year graduation rate, or we're not talking no, we're, about graduation? We're, we're talking, talking about, about workforce, some college or above. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I knew the Austin part, oh, but I, I confess I do not know. Is, are you setting me up? Is it El Paso? Setting, it is. Number two number is two. El Paso. Yeah, good. Most people don't know that our, edu our workforce is that educated, and yep. it's changed in the last 25 years, and mostly because of work done by my predecessor and William and the school districts, right. and the, the El Paso Collaborative, which has focused relentlessly right. on getting students from high school into something else. But before I go to Dr. Flores, let me ask you to, to uh, Dr. Serrata's point. We are only graduating about one in five after six years. That is the coordinating board's cohort number, that about one in five graduate with some kind of certificate or, de or degree six years out from high school. If you are African American, if you're Hispanic, if you're male, or if you're poor, those numbers are lower. Um, you're new to this, but you know what's what. That's not good enough, right? We it's need to be doing enough. better. And even though 
we're the second most educated city in Texas, we're not competing against Laredo or San Antonio. We're competing against Singapore and Munich and Seoul. Right. So, so, so what was good enough for our parents and our grandparents is not good enough for our right. children and our grandchildren. Uh, Dr. Flores, you have the perspective of New Mexico, our neighboring state, but another state in its entirety. You do not own the success or failure of higher ed in Texas, but you do own the success or failure of higher ed there. How are you doing? Anything to write home about? We are doing a lot of good things. Uh, we're also doing some things to improve. But before I get to that, can, can I add a couple of things to the questions you Please. asked earlier? Please. Uh, really, the value of higher education, uh, it's going to increase tremendously in the future. We have data and we're looking backwards, but if we try to look forward, there's an estimate today that says that the graduates of today, th those that are in college this year, when they graduate, they're gonna change professions in their careers more than seven times. Think about it for a minute. I'm not talking change in jobs. I'm talking change in professions. Car careers. I mean, di di yes. different, just a totally different thing. Exactly, seven times. How do you prepare for that? if you're not educated, if you don't have critical thinking, if you don't have the ability to solve problems, if you don't have the ability to learn on your own. That's what higher education provides. That's what we at New Mexico State University have a goal to provide to our students more and more as we move forward. Yeah. Do, do you face the challenge, I mean you heard Dr. Strada, and Dr. Wilson say, you know, we're, we're, we're doing better but we're not doing good enough. Is that the same story where you are? Do you know your predecessor in the job? What, how the school has done over time? The numbers are ticking up, but they're not where they need to be? Similar story? Yes, I would say yes. I mean, we, we are doing well, but we could have done a lot better in the past and we could do a lot better in the future. So there's a lot of things that we need to do better on. So let me come back real quick, please, Mr. Smith, please. Because I think this is just paramount for the audience to know, for our K through 12 partners to know, for this community, the rest of the state to know. So we now produce just under the state of Texas, just under 11% of high school graduates in the nation. So the witchy data, which indicates that the Northeast and the West and the Midwest is going to continue to decline, the the South and Texas is based as part of the South in this particular data set is not going to decline. We're going to continue right. to grow. Right. We're now just under 11% of the nation's total high school graduates. So. I look at the data every day, and every, every I look at it and say, okay, this spring, you know, 69.9% of high school graduates are going to go to college. It was an inside higher ed piece about a year ago. So turn around, and I pull Texas out of the data. There's about 3.2 million high school graduates in the nation. You pull Texas out of the data, and it jumps to 72.2%. Indeed. They go you matriculate immediately into college. Our state is 20% below that. We're at 52% yep. matriculating to college. So... Your data is absolutely correct that 23 are getting a credential, but only 54 of those eighth graders are going to college. So we have Brian Woods, who you know, superintendent of Northside ISD, brilliant guy, says we have hyper-communicated the debt issue. It is an investment. It is an investment that is overwhelming. 87% of our first time in college students are on some type of aid, of which 90%, 97% is either Pell or scholarship. So you're, you're saying that we talk about higher ed as a cost item when we ought to be talking about it as an investment item. An investment for the right. individual, an investment for the community, an yep. investment for the state, and ultimately an investment for the nation. Dr. Wilson, less about UTEP, because again, you're still relatively new here, but more in general about higher ed leadership and the degree to which you have or, or do not have the ability to affect the outcomes that you're, you seek. How much of your success do you think is in your control? Some things that are on your campus, decisions that you can make that are, are catalyst for outcomes, and how much are things off your campus that you have no control over and it's just taking incoming? Well, I have tremendous influence, and I think the partnership gives us influence. The thing that I would say, and it builds on what William just said, is one of the things that's changed over the last 30 years is we've gone from this campus being 69% state-funded to 24% state-funded. And so we, we are not effectively communicating the community value of education. Right. And, and, and as that shifted, we've talked more and more to parents about the value of education for their children as if it's only a personal benefit. But here's the reality. If I take my child to the urgent care and there's an educated nurse there, that I benefit from that. 
I benefit from the fact that my 401k statement comes and a qualified financial person has been working on that, those investments. The community, we all benefit from living in an educated community. So we haven't sold the value of that right. sufficiently. We've lost that sense. So, so 24% of the funding of this institution is state funded. I bet there are, there are higher ed institutions around the state that would kill for 24% funding. Yeah, we're, we're 21%. Right. I mean, the fact is, you know, we, we spent the entire last legislative session and many sessions before bemoaning how the state's share of public ed funding had gone down into the mid 30s. Higher ed across the state is nowhere near the mid 30s, right? And we have an obligation to make sure that we get a dollar and 10 cents of value for every dollar that we spend. Right, no of course. question. Of no course. question. Taxpayers demand it, and legislators will hold you accountable if the sure. taxpayers don't. Sure, sure. But nonetheless, the state's share of funding of higher ed is not what it could be or perhaps should be, and in part that's because we haven't sold the value of higher ed. And it has changed the way we talk about it because we know that most of the bills are being paid for by the students and their families. And so, so we talk about education as an individual yeah. value rather than a collective value yeah. for us as a community. But the regions of the world who choose to educate their people, not just some of their people, right. not just the kids born on third base, but the, 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 the communities that choose to educate their people will thrive in the 21st century, and those that don't will be left behind. Uh, Dr. Flores, do, do you have a conversation in, in New Mexico about the state's share of higher ed funding the way that we do that Dr. Wilson just alluded to here? Absolutely. Uh, and it's across the nation. It's not just in right. Texas or in New Mexico. Uh, we do get some support from the state. I yep. think uh, overall for us is about 30%. Uh, if you don't include certain items, if you do, and if you include the research component, for example, you know, we have $105, $110 million in research, then, you know, it drops to about 20 or 22%. Right. However, the interesting uh, component here is that that support continues to drop. Yep. And <clears throat> it's... This is something. It's heading in the wrong direction. Correct. Yeah. And and even for us, for, for for the state of New Mexico, in a year where the income has increased significantly, the the state budget has increased significantly both last year and this year. Right. The support for higher education is just simply not there. Yeah. Uh, and and I do want to echo what my uh, two colleagues have said. We have overemphasized the cost of higher education and the debt of, of people that go to college versus the investment that you mentioned uh, to. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I mean, if you look at what a student pays to come to New Mexico State University, it's less than $9,000 right now. Yeah. Net. This includes not just tuition, right. but fees, housing, uh, books, the whole And, the whole and yet your, I'm sure your cost of educating that student is significantly in excess of $9,000. That's right? correct. So it's really not just about cost versus value, it's about price versus cost versus value. That's correct. Right, you're talking at three different ways to measure it. Um, and and it, can yeah. I add one more thing? Uh, please, because yeah. I think it's also important to remember that this is an average value. For us, the students that come into the university and are from low uh, uh, income families, those that make 40, 48000 or less, they actually pay less than $5,000. So we have a system in place to support people to get their education, even though federally, the state, and, and the local governments are, are not really Are, are not putting up enough to, to take care of that, yeah. Uh, Dr. Serrata, let me ask you, since this is a conference on the future of the border region, would we be having a different conversation if the higher ed leaders on stage with me were not you three, but were the presidents of UT Dallas, Dallas Community College District, and Oklahoma State University? Do they have the same concerns that you do? Are there things particular to the border as a through line here? They would be having a very similar conversation. My good friend, uh, Chancellor Joe May at Dallas Community College District, um, they, I'm glad to say that they've learned from the great work that we're doing here in El Paso. Uh, given the fact that Dr. May and his colleagues at the university as well as at the school districts have just opened, I believe they opened 15 early college high schools all at once. We currently have 17 early college high schools in right. cooperation with our school districts and with UTEP. We are in the planning stage for six additional ones. Um, and I'm sure he'll learn how we do it so successfully. 73% of our early college high school students receive their associate's degrees before they graduate from high school. Uh, the national average is 25%. The yep. state average is 30%. So El Paso, Texas, uh, two and a half times the state average. So one aspect of the border is that there is a culture already embedded 
of early college high school, let's get out in front of this, react, uh, proactive rather than reactive. That's correct. Right. I mean, we've been working on this since 2005 when we opened our first early college high school, which was the second in the entire state of Texas. And we've learned from that. We've expanded again in cooperation with the university and our K through 12 partners, expanded those. They by far have the highest success rates of any of the students. And so what we're doing is we're scaling. Not everyone can get into the early college high school, but everyone can take dual credit. And we yep. continue to expand that. So what you're seeing actually in Dallas is they're starting further behind. Um, now they have many more resources to utilize, in particular the tax base here. The mayor speak to that earlier. The tax base which allows them to do more and faster but they are actually seeing a, a significantly lower participation right. rate. The border traditionally has had, had, has had the highest participation rates in direct matriculation into college. The issue is that they're still not yeah. high enough. So you're overperforming, but you're under-resourced. That, that, that's the point. Um, Dr. Wilson, I looked up the enrollment uh, statistics or demographics of enrollment at each of these institutions. I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, North of 80% of your enrollment is Hispanic. 85%. 85%. Uh, Dr. Sarai, 80, 83%? 86%. 86%. And Dr. Flores, it's north of 50%, right? Uh, it's about 64%. 64%. Okay, so maybe the numbers I've seen were a little bit outdated. That's obviously, Dr. Wilson, one thing that would be different if I were having a conversation with three other higher ed leaders. University of Houston, Lone Star College, Louisiana State University, right? The, the demographics of the student population is a driver of both decisions you have to make, challenges, opportunities, and outcomes. Talk, talk about that. Well, I, I actually think UTEP is, and this collaboration actually here is one of the, the best examples for what higher education has to look like in the 21st century. We are already serving a 21st century demographic. Yep. It's not only 85% Hispanic. 3% African American, 3% Asian American, 1% Native American, 6% Anglo. So we're lacking diversity. When people talk diver lacking diversity here. Right. Well, you're, you're listed online as a low diversity campus, which yes. is hilarious to me. Yes. Right, yeah. It's, it is funny. Right. But, but, uh, so, but here's the other interesting thing. Half of our students are first generation college students. Two thirds of them come from families making $40,000 a year or, or less. less. Right. And so this collaboration, 70% of our students last year graduated with at least one course from the community college. And so, so while we are a world-class research institution, a Carnegie One R1 institution, we are also in the top 10 in the country at moving students from the bottom 20% socioeconomically to the top 20% socioeconomically uh, by the age of 34, which yeah. is remarkable. Right. So part of your responsibility, in fact, is setting the table of opportunity for everybody, right? It is, and showing the way, and showing how you don't have to choose between being an excellent research institution and, and providing opportunity it's both to end. everyone. It's both ends. Dr. Yeah. Flores, t talk about that from your lens. Well, so the statistics are very different, maybe slightly different, but uh, you know, we're Hispanic-serving institutions, we're minority-serving institutions. Again, more than half of our student population is a first generation. You know, they, they come from families that they don't understand what it means to go to college. Nobody can help them understand right. and, and go through the navigation part of, of the college. But I think what's really important is exactly you know, what, what you heard earlier, that we really help all of those students succeed. We don't help only the ones that are well prepared. We don't help only the ones that have the money. We don't help only the ones that have, you know, sort of privilege. We help all of our students succeed. And one of our goals is really this movement upwards, social mobility. And, and we do this best than anybody else in the country. Absolutely. And in the social mobility index, um, Raj Chetty's work is, is out there. New York Times just published the most recent. El Paso Community College ranks fifth in the nation for social mobility. 37% chance from going the lowest quintile up at least two quintiles. What percentage of your students, since we heard from Drs. Wilson and Flores, are first generation? Seven, over 70% of our over students 70. are first generation. So college. that's obviously something that along the border, it's probably not specific to El Paso so much as it's more likely to be the case in border communities than not. Dr. Wilson, let me ask you about access. You know, there's a lot of discussion these days as the population of Texas is growing precipitously. Do we have en enough spots on university campuses? Does everybody who wants to go to UTEP have a spot? Yes. And, and that's not true at, at, 
uh, some institutions which would call themselves flagship institutions. Indeed. I actually think that some of higher education, as it's true all across the country, have gone in the wrong direction. And they were encouraged by groups like US News and World Report that define excellence by how many people a university refuses to serve. S selectivity becomes a measure of excellence. Which right? is yeah. silly. I mean, what restaurant do we say is great that tells 90% of the people that come to the door that you're not allowed to eat? <laughs> this makes no sense. And last year, they actually changed their rankings and stopped looking at, I can play that game if I wanted to. Right. We don't want to, and it's wrong for Texas. So, so UTEP is committed to helping Texas succeed, which means anyone who wants to come and have a shot here can have a shot here. One of the worst indicators of college success is test scores. Terrible indicator. Why yep. should we use something that's a terrible indicator of success to help a student succeed? So have you thrown out the SAT and the ACT as a metric for admission? I do not care. You don't, well, you don't care, but do your admissions people no, care? No, we don't, we, uh, no, no. You don't it use them anymore. Matter. What do you think, uh, uh, Dr. Wilson, about the legislature's hands on the instrument panel here with regard to the top 10%, 6%, whatever we're talking about at various institutions, the notion of automatic admits based on where you rank within your high school class and the reduction of the amount of discretionary admits that people in the admissions business have as a consequence of that. What do you think about that stuff? I think that as a result, UT Austin is not part of the problem and they're not gonna be part of the solution. Say that again, you think they're not part of the they're problem? They're not part of the problem that we face in the 21st century right. and they're not gonna be part of the solution. They will cap their enrollment as, this, as we need right. more people educated, which means we're gonna have to leave them behind. But there are a hell of a lot of parents, uh, Dr. Wilson, whose kids are applying to UT and not getting in, but getting into Ivy League schools, and they think something is upside down, and that is a byproduct of that automatic you know, admit system. All right, so I went to some of the most, you know, you can name dropping You did pretty good. All right. Let's acknowledge <laughs> so, that, yes. What I tell students is it, it matters a whole lot less where you go than what you do when you get there. That's right. what matters in college, is what you do, what are the opportunities you're going to avail yourself of when you get there. And that's, that's, uh, that should be the focus. Dr. Sraad, I'm going to ask you the same question and then take it wherever you want. Sure. Anybody who wants to go to El Paso Community College has a spot? So we are very proud to be an open admissions institution with high expectations for the students that we serve. So that is what we go forward with every day. Um, we are very much like K through 12. They bring in every, every student that is part of that district and then they are held responsible for the success of those students. I'm very comfortable with that. And we're very proud, as I said, to be an open admissions institution. What we have to look at is we have to continue to dig into the data. And so what you'll see in this region, we lead the state again, 89% of students that go to college in this region, they either go to UTEP or EPCC. So if you look at the largest school district in our region, El Paso ISD, fourth, over 4,000 graduates, um, about 1,000 went to UTEP, about 900 went to the college, and the next highest, speaking of UT Austin, was 70 that went to UT Austin. So I certainly appreciate, and I went to one of the flagships as well. I agree with Dr. Wilson wholeheartedly. The issues in the, the, that we confront in our state, they will be solved by the community colleges and the regional universities in order to serve their respective communities. And that's both by design and necessity, Dr. Wilson, because as you point out, the flagship simply can't accommodate everybody who thinks that that's where they should go. Well, and you know, our freshmen, our, our classes here, 16% of the student body at UTEP were in the top 10% of their class. This is a world-class research institution, and the students in this valley, you know, they won the lottery. They were born next to a world-class research university that will actually allow them to come and will support them when they're here. And, they, and again, to the point of promoting what is here in their own midst, they know it. You do a sufficient job of promoting that. I'm not sure we do, and I think, and I find this, so, so Jay and I have been here for six months now, and one of the things that surprises us a little is the number of people who come up to us and say, so how do you like El Paso? <laughs> and there's almost this worry that there's a there's kind of a um, a um, a worry that maybe we're not good enough. And I love what Jay's now started to say to people. The we in this case are not you and Jay. It's El Paso, right? No, that it's that okay, people expect checking. us not to like it. Um, or and or uh, and um, you know the number two. And so what Jay started to saying is, what's not to like? You know? True. So, but. But my point is that we need to hold our head a little bit higher here. The best students here can compete with the best students anywhere. Uh, but there's right. no question. Right. Well, you know, the other thing is, I always think with regard to 
with regard to promoting yourself, modesty and humility are overrated, right? If you, <laughs> if, if you don't tell your story, nobody else is going to tell your story. How many enrolled students do you have this fall? 25,000. 25,000. How many enrolled students do you have? Over 29,000. 29,000. How many do you have? 15 on the main campus, about 25, 26. 15, 20, so, And do, do you have any uh, conversation in New Mexico about whether anybody who wants a spot at one of your campuses can find one? Yes, of, of course. Uh, we, we have uh, a, a GRE minimum, I'm, I'm sorry, not GRE, uh, a GPA minimum. Minimum, yep. Uh, but it's very low. It's 2.75 from, from high school. And even if the, the kids that don't make that, we they go to our community colleges and they right. can transfer. However, I, you know, I wanted to, to add it uh, to, uh, to Heather's comment about how good our students are. Uh, and most people don't realize that exactly because we're we're just you know this is a region that is very very shy and and it's it doesn't really like to to say how good we are. So we just recently completed a survey of our students and alumni. Our students know how good their education is, and they tell us up front, "I'm proud of my faculty. I'm proud of my education, and it's really good value." When they go out there and they get to compete with the MITs and, and the UTs and all the, the Ivy Leagues and all the, the big publics, they start to feel this pressure. However, the companies that hire them tell us that your students are actually better than many of the other students because they have a culture, they have a work ethic, they have to work, most, most of them have to work as they go through school. Right. They learn things, not only through college, but through, our, through their lives that are very, very useful tools and skills that they have. And to that point about tools and skills, let me ask you, Dr. Flores, are, are, you, are you doing well not just at graduating students, but at graduating workforce-ready students. This is the bauble on the chime bracelet right now and in every conversation about education. Not are you getting kids through, but are you producing workforce-ready graduates? How are you doing specifically by that measure? Yes, yeah, so, so we, we try. Uh, we understand what it takes to produce a good engineer. And we produce a lot of good engineers. We understand what it takes to produce a good scientist, and we produce a lot of good scientists. However, I do want to say something about education in general. We produce, we have to produce educated people. And I'll go back to what I said before. Those kids, as they go into the workforce, they're going to change jobs all the time. They're going to change professions, careers all the time. You can't just look at the first job. You have to look at their lifetime and you have to prepare them for the lifetime. That's what we're concentrating on. And yes, yep. the answer to that question is yes, we are preparing them very well. But I, but I appreciate, Dr. Wilson, I appreciate that Dr. Flores has alluded to, if not come, outright and, uh, come out outright and said, that it is not just your responsibility to educate future uh, members of the workforce. You're also educating future citizens, right? You're educating people at, at this point for citizenship in the 21st century. And so the responsibility extends beyond whether or not you're preparing people for a career. That's true, and that's what higher education has always had a responsibility to do, prepare right. broadly educated, involved, engaged citizens who are, so, so it is not just workforce training, it is education. But I would say one of the things we're trying to do more of here at UTEP is give students an opportunity to, for community engaged learning, for, for co-ops and internships right. and practice in communities so they get all the, the kind of teamwork and leadership skills that, that are essential beyond being an engineer. How integrated, Dr. Person. Wilson, is this institution with the business community? in El Paso and the surrounding communities. How integrated? In other words, I'm taking you at your yeah. word that part of the responsibility of the university is to provide those kinds of hands-on experiences that prepare people for the lives they're gonna lead once they're off campus. How much are you integrated with the business community in preparing you know, give, giving them that kind of preparation and, 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 and exposure, opportunity. We were just recognized last week as a Carnegie engaged institution. Right, your second but, big Carnegie designation, that's indeed right. right, yeah. And there are only, I think there are only 70 or so in the country, in the that, whole are country. Both, yeah. that are both research intensive and community engaged. But I would say that with respect to the business community, we need to increase our engagement so that we not only understand the needs of business, but right. that, that business um, business is working closely with us to identify the next generation needs. Right. Uh, Dr. Serrata, as Nancy Pelosi would say, now we're in your wheelhouse, okay? Um, when we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the, uh, 
uh, the integration of industry and higher ed. I mean, this is where community colleges live and thrive is to prepare students through your door. It's where we should right? live and thrive. It's where, it's where we should live and thrive. And yet the data, when I came to the institution, we're about 88% academic transfer. I don't begrudge those programs at all. They're good programs. We want to make sure that they transfer to UTEP, to NMSU, or any other institution they want to go. But from my perspective, in an economic development, we heard a lot about that earlier today. Right. Um, for, to, to drive that, from my perspective, we should be at least 30% career technology, CTE education programs. Um, and everyone forgets that nursing is a CTE program. What, what's keeping you from yeah. being at that number? So, so the biggest issue from that, and you're seeing the student shift as well, but the biggest issue was facilities for the institution. Uh, you and I were uh, mentioning earlier the trip to Singapore that we were both fortunate to be a part of Indeed. Uh, through HEB, sending us to Singapore on a learning tour. That trip changed me, it changed our entire master plan with the Board of Trustees to come back and really focus much more on technical education. Because they have, just so people are clear, they have a culture culture in Singapore of higher ed at that level, what is our community college level, being intensely, intentionally integrated with industry. Correct. And right. as a result, you know, we're adding 400,000 square feet, which, by the way, the college is paying for. It's not taxpayer, not the state paying for. The college is moving right. forward with four, adding 400,000 square feet, six projects on the five campuses, of which 74% of that square feet will be either CTE or STEM related. And we're already seeing the shift. This fall, 15% increase in CTE programs. Right. Students have shifted as well. With all the rhetoric that we hear across the nation on questioning the value of higher education, we see um, undeclared students at the institution is down to 300 students. Students are coming in with, this is what I want to do. This is degree, a lot more CTE programming to get yep. into a living wage job. And we're doing our best to build those facilities to ensure that we're ready for right. it. You know that I respect community colleges and the role that they play. But I want to ask this question sincerely. Yeah. Is community college enough these days? Should you be lily pads or leap pads from a higher ed standpoint? Should you be the place where people start and then the transferability question becomes much more relevant? Or is a community college degree and the experience you're describing adequate for the future? So what I would say is that that is very much the student's option. And we want to make sure that they're prepared. And even if they get the Associate of Applied Science, that they're able to transfer to get a, the BAAS to move further in their respective careers. But I'd ask you this, an echocardiography technician, I saw Tracy yell in the audience and she was saying that this is what our community demands. And I said, well, good thing you're saying that because we're building the program right now. Those students will start with an AAS at $72,000 a year in El Paso. So if they choose that that's the finish line for them, I right. think that they can provide for their It's a heck of a finish line. Wage. Boy, I, I maybe need I to go I want them to continue, and, but I, I know, think that there you go. Nonprofit journalism is sounding a lot worse by the minute, actually. Wait a minute. <laughs> Evan, um, can, I, can I add something Please. to that? You, know, you talk about, well, is that yeah. enough? Um, I'm, not sure, so, I'm not sure whether, uh, because I agree with John, our children and grandchildren are going to be changing careers and professions multiple right. times, which means learning has to be much more of a spiral than just a one-time or two-time thing. Right. And how we as universities adapt to that and provide for the continuing professional education and personal yep. education of our citizens, I think, is still an unanswered question. So, so you bring up a great point. I want to ask you and Dr. Flores in particular this, and that is how adaptive are your insight? You know, the, Big institutions of higher education are like steamships, not cigarette boats. It's very difficult to change. It's very difficult to turn. It's slow by nature. It's bureaucratic. It's process focused. Um, you, you'd love to be in a position where you were kind of taking turns at such a sharp angle that you were at risk of capsizing, right? There's something exhilarating about that. Can okay, you... I don't do boats. I do airplanes, but maybe well, fighters okay, but rather than. Pick your vehicle. I don't, that's a, yeah. But are, so are you, are you uh, piloting a, a jumbo jet, uh, Dr. Wilson, or I'm going to just be so out of my depth in a second, or is this a, a little Cessna? I mean, what, do, do, you have, do you have the ability to change based on changing circumstances on the ground the way that you'd like? Uh, not the way I would like, and I don't think we're as nimble as we need to be, uh, and there are constraints. 
accreditation is a constraint. Governance is a constraint to get to get the you know get the approvals to do what would. And there are the, reg the regulatory that. environment, right? As the business community might say, and, right? And yeah. there's always a risk there that you won't put in place a program that's the quality that maybe a higher education institution should have. But yeah. at the same time, we need to be more right. responsive to the community research. You know, Dr. Flores, risk aversion is the thing that's killing the legacy institutions in my business. I don't know if it's the same in higher ed. I mean, you have to be willing to try something in service to greatness and fail, but learn from failure. Is higher ed situated to do that? I would say yes. Uh, and, and I would add, uh, yes, we are slow-moving vehicles. Uh, whatever vehicle you want to pick. We, we, <laughs> I like boats. I was actually we, good with boats. We do, we do not change very quickly. That's true. Yeah. But we do take risks, calculated risks. And the reason we don't change very often and very quickly is because our product takes, on average, four, five, six years to produce. You can't change in the middle of a production line. Right. Right? However, we try a lot of things all the time. The other part that you have to understand is we're made of faculty members, of really brainy people, smart people, that take risks all the time. Each one of our faculty members is an independent entity. Right, and we put them all together in one space, and we let them go to to innovate, and they do. So yes, we do take risks, we do make changes. Maybe not as as quickly as private industry and and other uh, right. parts, but we do change, and we have changed significantly. However, I do want to go back to the to the question you asked uh, earlier. You know, how well do we connect to our communities, and how well? Our students are prepared, and should they? Is, is a community college degree uh, enough? Well, on the last portion, it might be enough for today, for that one example or two or five. Right. Somebody can graduate and has a really good job with 70 or 80 or $90,000 a year, but how long is that going to last? Right. And what do you do next? Yep. So my position on that is you have to get an education. You have to finish college. As a matter of fact, you probably need to go to grad school. That's the future. On, on it, in terms of how well we, we connect with right. the community, how well we connect with industry, uh, I think many of our universities, many of our community colleges do an excellent job of, of connecting. Can we do better? Of course. New Mexico State University, we're what we call a land-grant university. Right. We have presence in every county throughout the state. We have uh, science centers all throughout the state. We connect not only with the industries all throughout the state, yeah. but with communities, with individuals. We take the knowledge from the university out to the people. That's our nature. So, yes, we do connect very well. We're at the community college, and you'll find this throughout the state. I mean, we're, we're fortunate that we can move uh, much quicker. And so I'll give an example. Prudential was coming into town, and they asked for us to work on developing the curriculum. We had it ready in five weeks. We had to wait for them wow. to, get, to move into town. So that is one of the areas where the community college is much quicker and can respond to the business community much faster. The issue usually is resources. Right. The resources to do that is much is, is So that's, that's a, per, a perfect tee-up, because I do want to come back to the question we started out with. I didn't intend for us to go right to price and cost and value, but do you have the resources, the money piece, to, to do your job? Um, is the state paying enough to cover the cost of higher ed? Are families and students bearing too much of a share? Is the debt question a problem? Is the affordability question a problem? Kind of, I, I want to I go to that. Maybe Dr. Serrata and then Dr. Wilson. Sure. So we're the best value in higher education. Uh, community colleges, we're the third lowest. Uh, Texas is the third lowest community college tuition in the entire nation. And yet what we see, as I said, 19, in 1984, 72% of our uh, budget was state appropriations. Yep. Today it's 21% and falling. And I'm very thankful. I, there's several legislators in the room, Representative Fierro, Representative Blanco in the back of the room, for, for the funds that we receive from the state, but we are seeing more and more of that shift to the student and parent and to the local taxpayer. And I do believe, and we continue to hear that it's going to be a higher ed session. That makes me nervous during a redistricting session, uh, that it's a higher ed session because we need to make sure that, that, uh, that higher ed doesn't only mean tuition revenue bonds. Because even for the university, that's just permission to build them. It's not actual funds to build them. Well, but this is also pandering, Dr. Wilson. Shouldn't every session be a higher ed session? I don't understand why the legislature can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Did you just say that with your I outside did. voice? I did. 
They hate me anyway. I don't care. Um, I mean, but because you know, the thing is, last session was a pro last session was a property tax session and a, and a public ed session. And if you cared about anything else, including higher ed, you jumped up and down, waved your arms, stamped your feet. Nobody paid attention to you. People think it's going to be a higher ed session, and they also think it's going to be a healthcare session, and they also think it's going to be a transportation session. And there's not enough money for it to be all of those things. So, what's the argument for it being a higher ed session from a cost standpoint? One of the, and I, let me build off something William said. Sure. One of the things I worry about on the shift of the cost of higher education to families is the families that need the help most are bearing more of the burden. And even though here at, at, uh, at UTEP, a family making $40,000 a year or less, a student from one of, a family making 40000 or less will have all tuition and mandatory fees paid for. Right. But the family who's making fifty, fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year is carrying more of the burden of the cost of higher education right at a time when it's really tough. So and that's the barbell. You can be poor enough and you're fine. You can be rich enough and you're fine. But it's the middle part that ultimately has I, the load. I worry about that. Yeah. And I worry about about the barriers that that puts. In, and, you know, it's not just tuition and mandatory fees. For our students, you know, a... a, 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 a a broken refrigerator at home can mean that they have to drop their number of classes they take this. Well, this gets back to the question I asked earlier about the things that you can control and the things you can't. You know, there's social and emotional learning at the public ed level. There's not as much of a discussion about the out of class or off campus needs that your students show up with every day that do have an impact on their ability to do well to complete, right? We have students here who are homeless going to college at UTEP. Right. We have a food bank here. That's I was going to mention that. I know that many of the universities are now starting food banks, right, to deal with food insecurity. As a we, we, have, we, have, we are serving people who are going to have their lives changed by this institution because they get a, right. you know, they get a credential of value and, and they go on to live wonderful lives. But the challenges for them are so much more than they are for the, our children. And then we ever really even appreciate because we don't talk about it very often. We don't. And then when the cost of education shifts to to those who can least afford it, away from the taxpayers generally, yeah. um, we're, we're putting a burden on families at a really tough time. Good. I want to go to questions from the audience in a couple of minutes, so line up and get ready for those. Uh, Dr. Flores, similar question to you on the funding of this. Are New Mexico families bearing too much of the share of the cost of higher ed? And, and what do you do about that? So the, the answer is yes. And as I said before, when we started, it's more and more. What, uh, what, what would it cost me if I showed up at your doorstep to, to take a year's worth of standard load of classes? What, what would it cost me? Well, if just the tuition alone, it would be about $9,000. And that's assuming in-state tuition, right? Correct. Right. Yes. And is that comparable, Dr. Wilson, to what you're... We're a little lower. A little lower we're, and we are the one of the lowest priced um, uh, among the four years. Yeah. yeah, and and Dr. Swara same. Full right? tuition and fees. You're looking at three thousand for the year at El Paso Community for College. For the year. I mean, Dr. Flores, it's hard to you know. I, I went to a small liberal arts college in the Northeast a million years ago. I would have killed to pay anything approaching any yeah. of those numbers forty years ago. Right. I mean, the fact is, Evan, it's a bargain. Well, yes, given what you get. It is, but if it costs seven hundred dollars and you only have five hundred, yeah, it's a bargain pocket, relative to your own matter. circumstances, right? I get that, right? Yeah, yeah but but the, the interesting part I think here is, you know, if you go to liberal arts colleges and Ivy Leagues, uh, you know, you're in a different category altogether. W what what I wanted to say here is, we make a significant effort to support the majority of our students, including those in the middle. I mean, the nine thousand dollars I mentioned before. We turn around and we give nine thousand dollars to our students on average. So if you, if, if somebody didn't have housing, food, and other expenses, we basically cover everything. You're covering it. That's right. Yeah, that's it's amazing. Yeah, but but I wanted to to say yes. that even in our state in New Mexico, last year the budget for the state went up by almost thirteen percent. We, higher education, not just New Mexico State, but all, all the, the higher education institutions, in essence, we were, we were given a cut. Right. Because we were given a small increase, but then they turned around and gave us a lot of unfund, unfunded mandates. Well, I, I know that the budget, the biennial budget, I believe, went up, Representative Fierro Blanco, 16% from biennium to biennium. Is that right? First quarter trillion dollar budget in the history of, of Texas. And I don't think higher ed came anywhere near a 16% increase in funding here. All right, let's go to questions. I've got other things I could ask, but go ahead to the audience, please, sir, and then we'll come back around over here. Um, 
Thank Look you. at that. Right. Every, every student situation is different, and there are some non-traditional situations, Dr. Flores, that you have to deal with. What do you do about that? So we are putting in place, we have some already, and we're putting in place some programs that address uh, all the different needs that our students have. Some students have financial needs, and, and I mentioned earlier that we have a, a huge uh, network of support when it comes to finances. Other students, it's not financial. You know, they may need academic work. So we have a, a whole slew of, of initiatives there to, to support them academically. Uh, others may have uh, other types of need. You know, there, there's a lot of students these days with mental health issues. So we have to put together programs to, to help every single one of those, of those students. I think the, the, the interesting part here is that the systems we have in place, they do allow a lot of those students to fall through the cracks. And many of the students, because they're first generation, because they don't understand exactly you know, what to do, they don't come forward to ask for help. And if, they, if you don't come forward to ask for help, the system finds it very difficult to figure out how to help. Is, is that, that is cultural? I wonder if you all are experiencing the same thing. Is that about the kids who are first generation for, or first their family to go, that there's something about that experience, that precise experience, that makes it more unlikely that they're going to ask for help? Yeah, that, that was what I looked at and researched in, in my dissertation, in particular for Latino males. And what you see is there's a real resistance, whether it's the culture, the pride, not to ask for help. We've tried to change the semantics of this particular issue and talk about uh, we're very good consumers and so you paid for all, with your tuition and fees, whether you're on aid or not, you paid for all these services. Make sure you utilize the services that you paid for. Glad you had a good experience at EPCC. We need you to continue your education. And there's, there's a lot of leadership throughout the state, including Mr. Hunt sitting in front of us, that is looking at promise programs for this region, for the state of Texas. You've already gone through, you may have some loan debt, but for students that are coming forward, that they would be able to look at a promise program to help facilitate the cost of their respective programs. We're seeing these starting in Dallas and going throughout the state. Uh, again, this is a symptom of, of a deinvestment from, from the state. Um, and I know that our delegation gets it and they're working hard, Senator Rodriguez here as well, to put more money into higher education so that we don't have to just rely on promise. But, but in the absence of the state and without putting more of a burden on parents and families, it falls to private sources of funding, philanthropy, right, to augment. It's kind of always been the case, Dr. Wilson, right? Well, 30 years ago, public, in, we're all from public institutions, right. public higher education. 30 years ago, public institutions might have done fundraising for the margin of excellence. Today, uh, uh, fundraising is part of what public institutions have to do for scholarships and all kinds of other things. Right. Hi. Oh. Go ahead. Hello. So I'm a student at Mission Valley College High School. I am a sophomore. But the talk is already that people are looking into universities to apply to. The reality is people do want to leave the state or the city. So what are your universities trying to do to convince these students to stay within the region? That's a good question. It's a, yeah. it's a the data, of brain the data drain, is overwhelming. Right? I'll, I'll let yeah. my colleagues. So the data, I mean, three to five percent of, of Texans leave the state. The vast majority of our population is educated here. We've already put a tremendous amount of resources. Mr. Barella and, uh, and others will tell you that by the time a student graduates from high school, we, in our communities, we've invested as taxpayers about a quarter of a million dollars into those students. When they finish college, it's even more. We want talent to stay in our particular region uh, to be able to contribute to these particular regions. So it is a smaller number than you're looking at. Um, but those that want to go away, there's lots of opportunities for them. You can transfer from EPCC to any university in the nation or world for that matter. It, it, I, can, I can add a couple things to that. I mean, we, we have specific things that we have initiated in the last couple of years. Uh, a lot of this has to do with recruiting. A lot of it has to do with how we present the university to our own backyard, to, to the students in our own high schools. 
Um, and, and many of those programs seem to, to have at least starting to pay off. I mean, for example, we have an honors program uh, that it's really, really very, very good for, for the students. But nobody knew about it. So as, as we advertise it, as we market it a little better, I mean, just this year alone, we have actually gotten students to change their minds to going from MIT and, and Harvard to come to NMSU. Because the fact is there are going to be some families and some kids who just want to be closer to home, right? And if you provide them with things that are comparable to what they can experience out of state, and it may be that you have those things or maybe you just have to sell them harder. Most students go to college within 200 miles of where they grew up. Yep. And so, so uh, there will be a small percentage of students that go to college out of state, but Texas needs to develop its own talent. Yeah. Sir. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Marquez. I'm from Northwest Early College High School. And my question to you is, what exactly do you think that the school system can do in order to push or uh, help students find jobs after they do get their degrees. I know there's a lot of students that finish school, they have their degrees and it just sits there while they get another job. And I know there's school programs or school internships that they can pick up, but what else could you guys do to push for that help? It's a great question. About 24% of our students go on to graduate school after they finish their, their undergraduate degree, which is great. Um, uh, we have two, actually two or three career fairs here on campus, and one of the things that, uh, that I've talked to Dan Arvisu, the chancellor about, and, and uh, uh, we'll talk to UNM about. So, so we have our career fairs right in a row, like uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, and we do it that way, and, and it's really great, because people can fly, companies can fly into Albuquerque and come down the river and finish up with us. We don't have enough local companies coming to our career fair. And we can't complain about the brain drain if we're not gonna recruit our own because companies across the country know the talent that they can get out of our universities. And so, so over this next year, we will be working with the Chambers of Commerce all the way from, from Los Alamos down to Fabens to recruit our own. Provide an internship to a student here. Recruit a student here. Because students who grow up here don't know all of the opportunities that they have here. And we Great. have an obligation to tell them. Good. Let me try to take one more before, I don't want us to run out of time, before we take a couple more questions. So go ahead. Okay. EPCC has thousands of early college students, and they don't pay for tuition or books. So how is this maintainable with an increase in early college students? That's a great question. So this wow. is part of, um, it's an invest. That guy should be lobbying correct. the appropriations committee for you. Yeah. That's yeah, pretty I'm, good. I'm hoping that, that the part of the delegations ends up on appropriation. The state of right. Texas has seen the value of dual credit in early college high schools. And so for a period of time, the previous commissioner of higher education questioned the quality and rigor. The data is very clear that the quality and rigor of early college high school dual credit programs, you all outperform every other segment of the student body, not just at the college, but the students that go to UTEP, 50% of those students go on to graduate school. So you all are leading the way. Um, what we're looking at is we do get a small percentage of the, of the state reimbursement for those respective um, courses. Uh, the Texas Association of Community Colleges, we're woke, working on our legislative agenda. Um, funding your your dual, costs are not covered, though, by what they're you They're not covered. Yeah. They're not covered. But, but uh, funding those at a higher level, dual credit and early college high school courses at a higher level, uh, probably will be a part of that. So that's part of the piece as well. And success points are part of what we look at as well, performance-based funding at the community colleges. And again, every time that you make an A in your course, I'm proud of all of our early college high school students that are here today, that will help the institution as so well. So Commissioner well Paredes, let's say his name out loud, uh, was not 100% behind what you're talking about. Have you talked to Commissioner Keller, new sheriff in town? So uh, right. Commissioner Keller has, has been great to work with. I was privileged to serve on his transition team. Uh, what he, Commissioner Keller, um, I would hope that he believes in dual credit in early college high school since he created UT Austin, a dual credit program called OnRamps. So I would imagine that he very much believes in the quality and rigor of these particular programs. Good. Hi. Um, would you say that as of today, a wealthy Caucasian male um, was actually less likely to be accepted into institutions of higher learning because... Most colleges actually want to accept, you know, students who come from minorities or I guess like less privileged backgrounds from not as wealthy families because they want to offer them more education, educational opportunities. 
the question is essentially, uh, <laughs> would, would well-to-do white applicants at a school now be at a disadvantage because of the emphasis that institutions are placing on more diverse student bodies, opportunity for everybody? I'm not sure we want to turn I'll, I'll this into a, as, into a pity party for I'll rich I'll white people. I'll let my colleagues not, respond, but, but, <laughs> but, but go on. As, as, a, as a minority middle-class male, um, we're, we're open admissions, and so I don't have to deal with that kind of a question. Community right, colleges yeah. are going to bring everyone yeah. in. Yeah. Go ahead. I, 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 I agree. I, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. Uh, there might be, you know, some of the uh, Ivy League schools and the very selective schools that they may have to, to look at it in a different way. But overall, I don't think that is the case, even there. And, and we accept everybody that walks through the door. We accept every, people too. Right. One of the things that's interesting, though, is if you look at the lowest quartile socioeconomically, they have a much lower, even, even if they are a high performing academically, they have a much lower probability of graduating from college than somebody who's in the bottom of their class but the highest quartile. Well, the assumption actually is sometimes that race is a, is a determinant of, of uh, success in higher ed. or It's actually poverty. Poverty is, is maybe the biggest determinant, right, of success or failure. So that's without regard to race. All right, we are unfortunately at 20 of two. What a great discussion and what great panelists. Please thank Drs. Flora, Serrata, and Wilson. We'll be back in about uh, 15 minutes with our final panel today. Please stick around.